name is Gavin Cooney. I'm the founder and CEO of Nervosity, a uh, technical company for session. Um, thanks for those familiar faces as well as came along. Um, with me is Edson. Do you want to introduce yourself? You bet. Edson Barton with uh, Youth Science, CEO of Youth Science, and uh, pre previous to that, the precision exams. And so the certification and testing space is very well understood and known to us. So we're happy to be here. So I, I, I would say that Edson, before we probably won't take all the time. 45 minutes allotted, maybe we'll do it at 40. He said, well, he talked to you for an hour and a half the other day. <laughs> so uh, we'll, see, we'll see how that goes. Um, Between the two of us, we can probably fill a couple of hours. Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll try not to do that. Right? That's, that's <laughs> the temptation we're going to try not to do. Um, so look, um, we're here to talk about kind of build versus buy decision, which tends to be kind of a, like a religious question for people. Uh, what you do, what you need to own, and so on. Obviously, we have a successful story here. Where uh, Edson Kindly uh, decided to, to license Veronosity. I want to talk to him a little bit through that decision making process and um, what, what came into that and what the pushbacks and what the pros and cons and stuff of that were. But um, starting off, tell me a little bit about, about Youth Science. Yeah, so uh, as you can see from Youth Science, we're really focused on a journey, a larger pathway for individuals where the convergence of industry and education that comes and meets together. There's been a disconnect, as a lot of you understand and, and very well know, between those two worlds for a long time. And we've developed a longitudinal process that starts off as early as middle school and tracks with the student all the way through career entry level. And the purpose is for us, what we've determined, is to engage students better in their educational pathway and improve every other academic and education outcome. Focusing on career becomes the key to that. That's true for the individual as well as for the institutions that serve those individuals. And of course, uh, one of the biggest economic drivers in the world today is the skills gap. And we believe that we've helped solve a big piece of that by helping students earlier on understand where they're going and helping them get there in a more efficient way. So one of the things I love about education is <clears throat> nearly everyone I talk to is, is on a mission. Uh, Nairobi is a manifesto around improving education and learning, kind of globally, and we, we feel like we're making a big in impact on that. And and um, you know we really believe education should be equitable, equitable and accessible for, for all. I always like to ask other people I meet in the industry have they got the same mission? Because there's a lot of people you meet and they 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 decided to become a teacher and then decide to be to, to to run a company because of that trying to improve education. So you have a similar mission. And yeah, very mission. very much so. And, and Personally, for me, uh, it's, it's part of who I am. I, I wasn't served in my own mind well by education, and so I've set out to help that. Our mission statement, just very simply, is to empower intentional individual success. And uh, success is different for everybody. If it was all about money, we wouldn't have teachers, for example. So we, everybody has a different pathway forward, and it's really important that we guide them towards those things and then help them achieve those. So look, we're at a basically investor conference in, in EdTech, right? So for context, where are you on that journey in um, VC or PEP or, or, or whatever? And I asked that for kind of context around the decision making around build versus buy and where you create value and who you're creating for and, and that kind of that type of thing. Yeah, so uh, we're, we're in the stage of looking at uh, private equity funding. We've been largely self-funded internally to this point, both uh, just natural growth and some internal friends and family, if you will. Uh, different types of investors. Uh, we've done a little bit on debt as well, but uh, that's relatively <coughs> new to it. So we're looking for growth. We, uh, as I mentioned, I was the CEO of Precision Exams, which is now U Science. We acquired U Science a couple of years ago, uh, actually two weeks before everything shut down in the United States on education. So on February 27th. So good timing. Uh, to do a merger, uh, but it was really the right thing to do. And, and the idea was uh, we needed to accelerate growth and help us achieve this mission that we had in a more holistic and different way. And so we're, we're right at that crossroads of we're growing very, uh, not just sustainably, we're growing very rapidly. Uh, last year, for example, we were, last year in July, we had about 35 employees, we're now up to less than seven months later, we're up to about 120, 130 with contractors and others. So we're, we're really growing rapidly. Uh, again, most of that's fairly organic. And so now it's about how do we, how do we really accelerate that? 
not to accelerate just growth for growth's sake, that's not the type of company we are, but growth to service more individuals, right? That, that is our, our primary mission, and uh, we're very focused on that. So how do we do that? I mean, we're here to help you scale, like that's the whole point. Yeah. So look, I know a lot of soul searching generally goes <clears> into these kind of build versus buy decisions. Can you frame that discussion for me and that, that decision internally? Yeah, it was a very large discussion. Uh, because we came, the, the core of what we did was Precision Exams, uh, which was a certification uh, company. Uh, this conversation was a difficult one, and it, especially for me, it, initially when our team came to us and said, hey, I think we should look at a different company and providing some of these core services, I was uh, incredibly resistant to that. So I was the founder of Precision Exams, that was our IP, that was a lot of things that we believe were core to who we were. And so it took several months of iterating on why we were, why we would even look outside of ourselves to do that. Uh, once we finally made the decision, I'll kind of jump a couple of pieces uh, and then we can have some discussion around that, that, you know, how we made those decisions. But it became very hard for our board as well. Uh, some of our board gravitated to this idea quite quickly, some others very much resisted the idea. And, and uh, so that conversation became the crux of, okay, why would we do this? And, and that really became the impetus for, for our discussions internally. Yeah. So that kind of IP issue, like you, you mentioned this before, you obviously made, made that leap and it's a leap we obviously strongly believe in. So where do you see the IP and how, how did you address that kind of thing in your mind? I think the, the primary thing, the, the final step that probably pushed me over finally was going back to our mission, actually. And, you know, there, as companies, we have a tendency to create mission statements that are so broad that they almost don't mean anything. We, we tended to be really specific, and we'll all have a pithy you know, one-liner there, but underneath that one-liner is, is quite a bit of meat that told us where we were going. And when we really analyzed our North Star statement, our North Star guide, we realized that we weren't a testing company. We were something else. And that testing for us, uh, in all of its different forms, we have, we have various different types of assessments, from aptitude assessments, interest assessments, uh, and of course certification assessments, and, and surveys on top of that. And we realized that while that was a mechanism for getting things done, it wasn't the reason for getting things done for us. Yeah. We were extracting that data and then using the data to do our next pieces with, and that became the core of who we were. And so then it became an investment, uh, meaning an internal investment conversation. What do we actually invest in? Because we only have so many resources, what do we actually put those to? When you say, you know, what kind of company you are, and are you an assessment company? I kind of think that there's, everybody can kind of do one thing as long as they focus on it all the time. Um, and we see ourselves as a, a partnerships company. That's kind of who we are, what, what our, our reason to be uh, is, is to, 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 to be a partner and to go, go from there. And a lot of things are fundamentally set up that way, contracts and the, the way we work and, and so on. The fact that we don't want branding in your products, and the fact that we're not trying to take your data, that kind of stuff, all because we're trying to be a partner. Uh, it's good that you, that's the leap you've got to make, is that you know actually delivering a multiple choice question is not, is not the thing, right? Uh, so so that, 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 that's pretty good. Um, uh, how, did you, how do you classify features that are really necessary to own and which are not? I mean, I always, I, I seem to think in 2D matrices all the time and, and I'll draw it up that would be kind of how generic a, a piece of functionality is versus how difficult it is or how expensive it is to, to own. Um, uh, how hard it is, I'm talking about undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, and I see features that are generic and hard to do as the ones that are obviously the ones that we need to outsource if at all possible. Uh, did you try and frame those things in, is there any other examples you think of that you wouldn't outsource because they're, they're not on uh, in that frame of reference for you? Yeah, so for us, you know, again, going back to the North Star of who, who we were. So if you look at, you know, internally actually what we accomplish as a company, we are helping connect individuals to their better path 
and then connect those into the organizations that can help them better in their pathway. So that became who we really were. So then the conversation became, okay, what are the core features that support that type of outcome, uh, that, that North Star, and what are the features or functions that don't necessarily support that? So in our case, uh, what does support that? Um, the way that we interact with the individual uh, test takers, and in particular the administrators, that's something that we wanted to control, and that's something unique to us because it's part of our relationship with the organization. Um, the way that the, we help connect students into these next phases of their lives or into their next pathways, that was something that we wanted to control. Uh, that was something that we believed in. Of course, our content. Uh, was very important to us, and that was something that we wanted to. So then when we started looking at, well, what don't we, you know, what are some of the tools that we already don't control ourselves, and why did we choose those? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first examples that came up that I think is a really good example is uh, our cloud-based services, right? So for our servers, uh, we, we use Amazon right now, and, and at the time we used uh, GCP as well. But that became one of those things where you know we, we, we've now forgotten this in, in our technology world, but we all used to have server farms inside of our offices, right? And now if I was to present that to a technology team, they would laugh at me at how stupid that sounds. But we all did that. Um, but at some point we made the leap to cloud services. <laughs> and God's telling us a sign right now. Should be doing that. Um, yeah, but, but you know, we made that leap at one point where it now became the not smart thing to do, but there were IT teams at the time that said, no, 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 you can't do that because you, you lose control yeah. of everything that you have, which was your data and your service, and what happens if your service goes out? It's about fear. I remember, remember pitching to a CTO, and he looked at me in the eye and said, well, remember Amazon were out for two days last month. I'm like, just, it didn't happen. Just like they, what just didn't happen it was a few years ago, but it was this kind of fear around around cloud services, and it feels so so obvious to do it now. And um, yeah, and, and those those kind of I, I do obviously believe that there's no very little thanks in kind of running a multi choice engine like this. What's, what's the point, right? Yeah. In doing it yourself. But there's um, tell me the conversation with your CTO. What I find a lot is that engineers want to engineer, right? Uh, and um, and also they tend to want to have another 20 people working for them and, and working away. And, and you've also got some, um, obviously, existing functionality you're removing to kind of replace that with your own city. I found in the past where, you know, we, we, we spent years building um, like load balance and stuff and then we kind of replaced it with the Amazon thing and, and uh, replication of databases and replaced it with the Amazon thing later on. We did some monitoring stuff and we replaced it uh, with something else later on and it's just kind of, moment where you're kind of going, oh, but I've spent all this money, it's a sunk cost, and I just got sunk cost, so you go to the restaurant, you order a dessert, you're not hungry anymore, but like, I paid 18 dollars for a chocolate cake, I'm going to eat it, and um, what, what, what was the, there is a sunk cost in there, and what was there, was there CTOs, or, or, or anything team pushing back on this, talking about, um, like, like they, want, they want to build a team, they want to, they want to build themselves, and uh, I often find as well that if you ask an engineer, to you know, estimate what it will take to do something. If they want to do it, this happens to me, by the way, with my engineers, and I say, like, if they want to do it, they'll have it done in a week. Like, and if they don't want to do it, like, oh, I don't know when I'll fit that in, and it'll be six months. Um, but was there not a point where you're, some of your engineer was kind of going, I'll do this in a week, or, or, or uh, this integration will take six months? Yeah, we, we certainly had all sides of, of personalities on that. Luckily uh, for us, um, my CTO is very pragmatic and takes the direction of what it is that we're trying to do very seriously. And instead of him trying to think of all the ways that he and his team can do everything that we're wanting to do, he looks at it and says, what are we trying to accomplish? What's the most efficient and best way to get there? And then let's look at those options. Now, he and I both uh, were, again, on the fence. He was on the fence of not uh, doing something with the third party on, on our testing system first. Uh, both of us were quite on the opposite side. 
our engineers who are over this product, meaning our testing product, they're the ones who first brought it to our attention. So mm -hmm. maybe we should do this to pursue in other ways. And part of it was because of self-preservation, quite honestly. We had a deadline that we needed to meet, and they thought probably by doing this ourselves, we can't accomplish it. So that started the question. Um, with the engineers who were more resistant to the idea, once everybody else started coming on board, I always, as, as a CEO, I kept bringing up, what are we trying to accomplish? Who are we trying to be? What are we trying to do? And whenever I would ask that question, then the engineers had to answer it honestly and say, well, we're trying to do that. And I'd say, okay, well, let's put our resources there, our internal resources there. What is it that we can outsource then? And all of a sudden, the conversation started becoming a lot more easy, and, and pretty soon then, it became clear, okay, now let's focus on what's the best solution that's external to us rather than us building it ourselves. I was really, like, there's a common fear here is loss of control, mm -hmm. uh, loss of control over certain features and so on. Was there anything, how, how did you address that from the people that came? Yeah, I, you know, the biggest example of that was actually with one of the board members who had been with me for a long time and um, very, very much concerned around loss of control. And in particular, as we look at raising capital or doing other types of activities in that world, becomes, do you own your IP or do you not own your IP? And this became a big question for us. Is this core to our IP? Um, and as we started to, again, obviously we made the decision that it wasn't. But for him, that became the biggest holdup, was is this something that we need to have that will help benefit us for our future, um, you know, some kind of outcome for, for the business. And the reality was is that it, it wasn't. Um, this is a period of time, we're, we're now living in this period of time where testing services are becoming the cloud services of yesterday, where they're now shifting to this more ubiquitous type of nature. And we need companies who can actually do one thing really well. And that, that switch for this particular board member was the one that finally pushed him over the edge and, edge and helped him move in that direction, which was the, the things on IP that we needed to own were the things that differentiated us in the market, yeah. not, this, not the things that made us at hot parity with everybody else. So that kind of helped separate that fear as well. Let's focus on our differentiation rather than yeah, when it comes to those generic features, there's not really a prize in getting them mm -hmm. right. There is definitely a uh, definitely a cost to getting them wrong, uh, and that's the that's the, the big distinction there. So there's not what, why you bother investing. And you, you have um, you sort of have to expand it massively, right? There used to be thirty five people to was it more than twenty? Yeah, hundred twenty. Um, yeah, you you want to utilize those developers effectively, right? So uh, the big thing here is not is not Focus on on the solve the problem. Um, was it that a big part of? Oh yeah. As you look at expansion. Yeah, huge part. And and you can look at a hundred other examples. And and it's interesting once you start using other examples, it becomes more clear. You know, we don't build our own CRM, and yet our relationship with our customers is paramount to us. But we certainly outsource our CRM because that's a function that is done much better than somebody else. Um, and and what in, ter in terms of inside your product, what else are you using? Clever. Yeah, so we do rostering uh, with different school systems. Um, trying to think of some of the others off the top of my head that, that are, are more similar to this type of thing. Um, no graphics stuff in the desk. Yeah, there's all sorts of, I mean, I, I quite literally, there's, there's hundreds of other tools that we use mm -hmm. that in some way you could say, well, that's really core to what we are. But when you look at what we're really trying to accomplish, it, it just becomes another service. I do think there's also a moment in time. 10 years ago, I don't think that this question would have been answered the same way. I would have said, let's build our own service, yep. let's do it that way. But the market has evolved so much at this point that it's, it, it became foolish for us to focus on this. Other well, we found, you know, we started doing this 10 or 12 years ago, and I was explaining what an API was to every single meeting. I still remember the first meeting I was ever in about eight years ago where they didn't have to explain an API. I met, I met Microsoft and I was like, okay, is this thing called an API? And the guy's like, yeah, I think I know what an API is. 
but and obviously now we don't, I didn't start this session talking about what an API is, I kind of assume it's there. So I'm going to take full credit of embedded <laughs> in, in, in EdTech. Um, uh, so, so, you know, it, but it is, it is kind of the modern way of, of doing things. Um, well, well, even within our platforms itself, right, we now build microservices with API connections between these microservices. Yeah. And so we're looking at our own software in a new, different way. Mm -hmm. And once you start to take that and embrace that type of development, now you can really start to embrace service providers that do something way better than you do. Yeah. And you can realize, well, I can build on that. I can do something different with it in my own way, but I can leverage the goodness that is there. Yeah, 100%. And then, and we we'll of course, what is an API, you have somebody who's kind of maniacally focused on some bit of functionality that you don't necessarily have to do, like Clever and, and rostering, or, or, or something with graphic calculator, that you wouldn't go as deep as anyone would go or an assessment for us. Uh, and you 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 you're you might be focusing on that, but also there's things like scalability and stability and um, uh, evolution of the feet. That, that's all about uh, additional features. That's, that's that itself is a feature. The idea of it modernizing itself, a bit like a virtual service, you can make it more scalable. You can make it. Um, you can add, add features along the way if you're doing it properly. Um, so. Talk about the, the, the board decisions. You know, like you, you've obviously kind of stood up to something there you, you believed in when you got there. How, 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 did, how did you navigate that? Well, I, one of the things, of course, that hopefully every team would do is we did an incredible amount of research on both your competition and uh, competition. Yeah, <laughs> competition. <laughs> uh, and so, but also, again, a lot of research on where we were going. And that became just, I can't, you know, for us anyway, that became ultimately the, the most important thing that we did. So as we put together all of the research and, and all of the documentation, it just became really clear where we were going. I think one of the other things around the board was what, what do we get measured on at the board level, and in particular for valuations of the business. Mm -hmm. And not once did, has any investor ever asked us, mm -hmm. how good is your testing engine? It's always, how are you working with the students and converting them into this? How are you engaging with them? How are you doing X, Y, Z? And it, again, it never came down to that core function. And it's very similar to, you know, we don't get asked questions about our underlying CRM. Right? Yeah. It's the our hero system. Our hero system. Hero system. Yeah. Yeah. So that, Again, the framing of those things became really important to us to try to understand, was this something that we should focus on? And then eventually the board took hold of that just as much as we did internally and started to run with it. All the due diligence, you, like, you, you're obviously looking at tech documentation, you're having somebody do a tech evaluation mm -hmm. of it. How do you kind of gain confidence in the product, both from a tech point of view and a partner point of view? I found this a lot harder when we were, when we were getting going and you know, the six of us in the company Nobody gets fired for hiring IBM, but like you definitely get fired for hiring like some guy uh, with funny accents in, in working out of a shed in Ireland. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, and we were literally working out of a shed. <laughs> um, there was a funny story years ago where we had um, a, I won't name the publisher, come and visit our office, our first office, and we had like six people in the company, but we needed to look bigger and they were very nervous about it. So we would, um, so that particular Tuesday when we were coming in, I had all my friends come. I stopped short of hiring all my people from the street <laughs> uh, to come. And like, you could see the publisher walk in and hand the people in the office and go, oh, it's like 15 of them, it's fine. <laughs> and we had like spare laptops on desks. And I swear to God this is true, I went down to Ikea that weekend and bought extra tables and extra, extra uh, chairs for the show and tell in the publisher. Um, but I, I, so and they were doing their due diligence, and I'm wondering like how do you how do you do that? Obviously we're a bit we're a bit bigger, but when you're evaluating those partners, how do you do that due diligence? Because it's not you're not buying from Amazon or Google so you, that you can do a Gartner report on or something. It's it's a you know how do you get comfortable comfortable with something? Yeah, initially the team came back with some I'd say pretty light duty due diligence where it was just feature set compared to feature set on different organizations. And so then what I did is I had them really focus on, okay, what is it that 
we need to really control? What is it that we want, what do we want that differentiates us? So as an example, one piece of our system that we're very proud of is how we enroll students into the actual testing process. And so we decided in our due diligence, we went through and we identified those different areas that we needed to be really good at and then what somebody else needed to be good at. That was really helpful because some of the other companies that are in this space uh, were much more full service. And that has a place for it, but there were things, again, we were thinking, how do we differentiate ourselves? How do we make ourselves different? And part of the decision on the Lernasi side is we went down the function list, and one of the, the really big pieces was the functionality to, <coughs> me, to be able to, to build our own pieces into your pieces. Yeah. So kind of that Lego building system really became important to us. So that became a huge function area that we focused on. Is, okay, where do we build APIs into? What can we extract? What can we do differently? In, in that? Yeah, it's funny you made talk with Lego. Uh, the reason why we started, we, we always use this Lego analogy. And we started doing that because nobody knew what an API was. And we had to explain, explain it in, in that way. Um, and, in, so we, you've done the, your tech due diligence and so on. How do you work out how you can trust a, a, a trust a trusted company? Obviously, I'm a very trustworthy kind of guy, right? but um, was was there a part of that? There is a little interpersonal piece there that you're kind of working with looking somebody in the eye, kind of working out who to trust them. Yeah, and, and that was particularly important to me, but certainly to my team as well. We yeah. we have a very cohesive team, and that loss of just development control started to play in a little bit. And so we started doing one-on-one -on -one meetings, of course, with the companies, and all of a sudden we found a pretty big disparity in how the approach between different organizations. Um, I will say one of the things that impressed me when the team came back uh, is when your team said, yes, here's a sandbox that you can play in, here's code that you can play with, start working and see what you can do with it. And and that was, and, and I think you were the only group that did that. From our team, that was critically important. And for me, that was critically important because we had very big expectations for this product set. Um, a huge portion of our revenue is still derived through cert certifications. And so having a failure here was not acceptable. And so that confidence of being able to work with somebody hand in hand, upfront, with no cost associated, and say, hey, can we do this, was really helpful for us. In the it's a really deliberate move by us, right? So there was a lot of, when we started this, um, there was a lot of vaporware, I call it, in EdTech. And it really pissed me off, because I mean, I think the education is the most important thing you could possibly be doing. And it was, was a mission there, it was a reason why we got into this game. And we found there was a lot of vaporware, a lot of people selling kind of PowerPoints and there was non-delivery and so on. Some of our biggest deals were because somebody else sold a PowerPoint, and six months later, 12 months later, had not delivered it. I was like, gleefully, uh, somebody would call up, and, and we delivered it in, in, in two months or something. And um, so what we did there was we, we figured that, and with some other people, <coughs> not necessarily an assessment, you, you would sign an NDA to look at the documentation or to get a demo or whatever. We're like, there's no NDAs, here's the demos put them on the website, <coughs> here's all the documentation put them on the website, because it was there, it was robust, it worked, and we could kind of show it off. And it was kind of a weird, moment where we're kind of going like, is, is there a competitive issue here? Somebody wants to come along and they're going to copy all our documentation or our question format or whatever it is. And we we decided that the, the, the pros outweigh the cons there by just putting it all out there completely public. And that enables you to kind of just, without even talking to us, you can go on, you can download the demo site, you can mess with it, you can break it, you can change the attributes, you can do whatever you want to do. That sandbox is, 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 is super important. Well, I was going to ask you as well because that, that became a really important feature, but that's a hard thing for a lot of businesses to do to say we're going to put some of our IP out there and then let people play around with it. For you, what was one of those reasons? I mean, you gave the reason there, but yeah. is, what was the challenge there for you to put that out there? Did you have resistance? Yeah, I had resistance. It was a long conversation about whether this was a, was a good idea and what they would do and what, what the competitors could do. Um, because you know, technically it's all there, so whether we create Lernosity, that though by though, all the documentation is, is there. And um, it was one of the things we kind of outweighed the, we thought the transparency of, of doing that. And also it was a statement against the vaporware and education, which just absolutely drives me crazy. It's too important to mess with. 
and um, so we, we, we decided to do that. There was no no PowerPoints. I for many years resisted using any PowerPoint, uh, and which we would have dri would have driven the other salespeople crazy in the marketing department crazy, and I would um, just do my my I just do a demo. I would just talk uh, without, without any. Uh, you know, I'm not talking about screenshot. I'm not talking about like, points on a, on a on a PowerPoint. I would ad lib all that and and just demo as soon as humanly possible because it was there, because it was robust, because it worked, and then invite somebody to use it themselves. And once it you know once it worked, it, it, it was it worked out pretty well. Um, so as, as we we're, we're, we are we are running time as, as expected. We're going to take a, a couple of Q and A from the audience if there's any. Any final advice for, for, for folks as they're, as they're building out the product? Yeah, I, I mean, I've already said it, but I, I would certainly encourage <clears throat> focusing on your, your, your goal, your North Star. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen way too many education companies that had a brilliant idea, come into market, get some initial customers, and then they realize, well, you know, and, and the focus is almost always on the student and, and those outcomes. And then all of a sudden they realize that it's the educators that are paying them. And so all of a sudden they start gravitating towards the paying customers and what their supposed needs are. And all of a sudden their product sucks and they go out of business or mm -hmm. they become defunct or, you know, all these other things. Um, when you're making this decision, the buy versus build decision, that North Star mm -hmm. becomes I was surprised actually. I, I'm naturally driven that way, but I was surprised at the clarity it brought around this decision for us and how it's now molded other things that we've done. And, you know, while I don't credit all of our growth to some of that, I think a lot of our growth and our future growth would be behind that concept as well. Yeah, that's how we do that. Any questions? Yeah, so <clears throat> just from a conceptual perspective, you know, with, with API, with building and, and integrating with APIs, there's always like a, a loose, uh, hopefully there's a loose coupling, you know, between the, the vendor and the, and the solution. And how do you avoid having the, the vendor's um, technical debt and roadmap limitations, how do you prevent that from becoming your technical debt and limitations or your problem, right? How do you keep that, that problem away from your shores? Because if you're, Truly, like that North Star. It's like I don't really want to have your problems too. Yeah. Right. I. So a couple of answers there. Every company has tech, right? And sure. so that's not unique to anyone. As we were evaluating organizations, um, we did a lot of uh, you know call a friend and say, okay, have you worked with this group? Who you know this reference to? Um, and that came up as well because, and I think this is critical in particular in this testing space or services where they start to become more commonplace. We, we obviously, we had our own testing engine there and to some degree we had API connections and they were part of our system. So the question became is we can either spend resources here or we can spend resources here. We can either you know, solve our tech debt in some way and the ongoing maintenance of all of that across two different platforms or we can specialize that. So now taking that into the decision about a third party doing that, it became the question of who is doing that best? Who is looking at themselves and saying, we are going to really focus on our key traits, our North Star, and we're going to continue to invest in that and then have a proven track record of doing that. And there were other companies in the space where it was clear that their investments over time had been minimal. And so you could see this cliff of tech debt coming up. Whereas with Luminosity, I'm, I'm happy to say that we didn't feel that. We felt like they're still investing, they're still building, they're still doing things. You know, and, and so you know, hard to keep on innovating. It's, you know, yeah. that, that's and that's the that's the difference. It's, it's nice and easy when you're the kind of new hotness and, and you've no tech debt, you've got zero users. <clears throat> turn the dime. 40 million users now last year we did with 17 billion questions. There's obviously going to be some limitations in there. You kind of, you know, we're, we're on a day-to-day -day basis, you've got some of our most talented engineers working with like database limitation sizes and stuff, you know, they, they, they sharding stuff and doing that kind of thing. Um, well, I guess how I ask the question is we we had to address that head on early on in terms of roadmap and so on. There's a few things we did. 
what it was in the, one of the fundamentals of building an API in the space was it shouldn't be prescriptive about what you should build. I shouldn't have any opinion about what you should do. And sometimes, um, sometimes it's difficult when I'm making a sale. I'm like, oh, we just like let me log into Schoology there and let me see your stuff. I'm like, I don't, I do not have a log. They built the thing. I don't know. So it shouldn't be prescriptive. But more fundamentally, it shouldn't be restrictive in any way. So let's just say we get bogged down in tech that we don't add an extra question type, for example. So it's a custom question type, but you can add your own in there. So we haven't done it. Maybe it's too niche. Maybe it's more specific. Maybe you want to own the idea of that. You can add a question type. You can add a workflow in the <clears throat> offering for your teachers or something. You can add custom reports. You can get the data back and do it yourself. Every, you can do unbelievable uh, customization of the of the testing interface. There shouldn't be any restriction about what you can add into it. And if it's sufficiently modular, it doesn't matter. Back to the Lego brick analogy, you give these you give these Lego bricks, it doesn't really matter if you're building the Barbie house or the battlefield. It's just it's just Lego. And um, well Barbie's still be painted by it's gonna be fun. So <laughs> Well, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, 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 yeah, okay, it's the internal, but you get the point. Um, but, but, but it's really, really important in, in that way you can build whatever you want to build. Um, apart from color, uh, but, uh, and, and that customization uh, and not restricting it. And that's the fundamental to answer your question. Yeah. Thank you. Time for another question or so? No? Okay, well, thanks very much for your time, everybody. Really appreciate it. And, uh, to, to chat. Thank you, and thank you very much.